Ruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, again, welcome to our house and to uh, the new normal. Um, with this pandemic and also the social unrest that's been plaguing the, the, uh, both the country and the world, many of us are stressed out and things may be said or done that are hurtful. So I thought maybe a good time to give a lecture on the uh, concept of forgiveness. You know, it's an easy word to say, but really a difficult concept to follow. The word forgiveness can be broken up into two words, forgive and then ness. Now the word ness in Hebrew means miracle. For a person to be able to truly forgive another person is nothing less than a miracle. Forgiveness was introduced in the world on the sixth day of creation. When man sinned by eating from the tree of knowledge, he asked God to forgive him, and God agreed. That day became a day of judgment and atonement for all times. On that day, man sinned, man repented, and he was forgiven by God. Now, without forgiveness between people and between God, we would not be able to exist. As it says in the story of Faust, as long as a man lives, he will err. Our greatest attribute as mankind is our ability to sin and then to correct our, the error of our ways, to grow, to learn, to get better, to have the wisdom and humility to ask for forgiveness. But, but, but not just lip service. True repentance comes from the heart and hopefully moves to the brain. We should feel bad that we have caused another person pain and we should want to correct the situation. Now, not all requests for forgiveness are the same. <clears throat> we see in the Torah that the Jews in the desert made the golden calf. God forgave them. However, when they cried in their tents about the incident with the spies, God did not accept their repentance. And the question is why? What was different? When they sinned with the golden calf, the nation acknowledged their sin, contrition. However, with the incident of the spies, they said that if God said we sinned, we sinned. Very ingenuous. If one wants a complete and true forgiveness, their repentance must also be complete and true. A reflection of that. Sincerity. In order for one to be forgiven completely, they must attempt to understand the pain that they have caused the other person. Without that recognition, the words that they are saying are empty statements with no or little meaning. We should try to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. As it says in Pirkei Avos, chapter 2, mission number 4. Hillel said, Do not judge your friend until you have stood in his place. In the book of Leviticus, in the portion of Kedoshim, chapter 19, verses 17 through 19, the Torah mentions four laws that deal with forgiveness. First, <clears throat> do not hate your brother in your heart. Secondly, do not take revenge. Third, not to bear a grudge. And finishes with love your neighbor, <clears throat> excuse me, as yourself. <laughs> wow. God has really set the bar pretty high. If you feel that someone has wronged you, the Torah doesn't allow you to keep the hatred inside. Why? Because all that does is destroys your twank tranquility and equilibrium. You know, there are incidents that occur between family, alluded to by your brother, associations that you may not choose. There are also other people that fall into a similar category, such as co-workers or bosses. Not all incidents need to be addressed. The truth is some are better left unsaid. But that is only if you can deal with it properly forgive them for the pain that they may have caused you. So if you can accept someone with their own character traits, even though their actions may have hurt you in some way, that's great. But if not, then do not hate your brother in your heart. You need to talk to your brother about the problem. It's amazing how much better things can get when people communicate properly with each other. The Torah then commands us not to take revenge nor bear a grudge. What's the difference? So Rashi, our most notable commentary on the Torah, tells us that revenge is when you ask someone to borrow something and he turns you down. So the next time he asks to borrow something of yours, you say to him that just as you didn't lend me what I needed, I will not lend you what you need from me. Revenge. Rashi then describes 
what it is to bear a grudge. He says, if you ask someone to borrow an object, he says no. Then later he asks to borrow an article from you, and you say to him, sure, I'll loan it to you. I'm not like you. That's bearing a grudge. The Torah is asking us to act like angels, not like people. It's not easy to not take revenge or bear a grudge. The Torah tells us to elevate ourselves. We need to try to emulate God in our actions. God forgives and forgets. You know, we may forgive, but do we truly forget? The fourth mitzvah, that of loving your neighbor as yourself, <clears throat> is the key to observing the first three mitzvot. The only one that one can correct, all the way one can correct the negative feelings against someone whom he hates in his heart, or to overcome feelings of vengeance, or not to bear a grudge, is to see them kamocha, like yourself. You know, there are many things that you do that cause you pain, personally, discomfort and embarrassment, yet somehow you still love yourself. So too, we should look at others with the same benevolent eye. In every situation, in every person, one can find extenuating circumstances. You know, many times it's not the action that brings out negativity. It's really the person. You know, the same action or statement done by two different people may evoke two totally different responses. From one, a comical resignation, the way he is, and for the other, just anger. We really don't judge the action. What we do is prejudge the person. It says in Pirkei Avot, chapter 3, mission number 1, the Kabi ben Hamalal says, reflect on three things and you will not come to sin. Know from where you came, know to where you are going, and before whom you are destined to give an accounting. Now the English translation here is really not accurate. <clears throat> the Hebrew word that for is din v'cheshbon, which translates to mean judgment and accounting. The English translation does not mention judgment, which makes a very big difference. The order in the Mishnah should have been accounting and then judgment. In a court case, first the evidence is brought, the accounting, cheshbon, and then the judgment is rendered, din. So why are they reversed in the Mishnah? First judgment, and then accounting. There is a Hasidic belief that when you die, you go up to heaven and stand before the heavenly court to be judged. What is the criteria that the court uses to judge a person? They look at his life, and they see how he judged other people while he was alive. They take a cheshben, an accounting. If he was able to judge others favorably, forgive and forget, then the din, his judgment, will follow the same direction, and they will give him a lenient verdict. If, however, his relationships with others were filled with hatred, vengeance, and bearing grudges, if he had in his lifetime condemned others for their weaknesses, misdeeds, and acts of folly, no thoughts of understanding or forgiveness, then he is, in reality, convicted himself to the same sentence that he thought was proper for them. We see an example of that with King David. And when the prophet comes to him and tells him about a man, a rich man, who had a poor neighbor with one sheep, and the rich man had a guest, and he sent his servants over to take the sheep of the poor man, and slaughtered the sheep and fed it to his friend. And the prophet said to King David, what should be done to this person? And King David said, the person should be killed. And the prophet said, the person we're talking about is you, when you took Bathsheba. He, he pronounced his own verdict. And that's what we do many times in life. And even if people say they're able to forgive, the question is, are they able to forget? As difficult as it is to forgive, forgetting is much harder. In fact, the Hebrew word for joy is simcha. If you move the letters around, it spells the Hebrew words shemacha, which means to erase. This tells us that the only way that one can be happy in life is to erase, to forget, especially in marriage. One needs to be able to turn the page, start fresh. What we do many times is we say that we forgive, but in reality we just 
file the hurtful incident in our hard drive, and it stays there for easy access. Once our spouse slips and messes up again, we see it as a continuation of their previous bad behavior. We don't give them any credit for the time and effort they exhibited in the interim. We just continue to connect their action with what they had done in the past instead of trying to forget the past and build a better and stronger future. We really need to emulate God Almighty. God's greatest trait is what we call Erech long-suffering. The fact that he is doesn't punish right away. He should punish immediately, but he doesn't. After we sin, he gives us the opportunity to correct the error of our ways. God understands that we may well <clears throat> change and get better, but it is a process. It may take time. Much like the side of evil, who initially doesn't get us to rob a bank, what he does is first he gets us to steal a penny, <clears throat> then little by little he convinces us to rob the bank. So too, do we need to change, work on getting better, but step by step, make it solid, always moving forward, never giving up. We as people <clears throat> are not absolutes. We are composites of different thoughts and experiences. If we are to grow, we must train ourselves to learn to accept reality. The reality that the only thing that is perfect in this world is God Almighty himself. All of us. All of us as human beings are brought into this world as imperfect perfect, uh, creations. <clears throat> it becomes <clears throat> our mission in life to strive for perfection. Now, we may never reach that goal, but for that we are not capable, culpable. We are culpable, though, if we don't at least make a sincere effort to change, to grow, to become better. As again it says in Pirkei Avot, chapter 2, 14, Rolazar said, it's not incumbent upon you to complete the work, yet you are not free to desist from it either. In the Amida, in the standing prayer, in the sixth blessing, we ask God for forgiveness. Salach lanu. We ask him to pardon us. Machol lanu. What's the difference between the forgiveness and pardon? The word forgive is connected to the Hebrew word avinu, our father. And the word pardon is connected to the Hebrew word malkinu, our king. A father forgives. The word salak, forgiveness, is mentioned three times in this short blessing. We have a tradition in Judaism that anything done three times, so that's what we call a chazaka, a precedence, and is considered as a vow. So in a sense, God is vowing to us that he will always forgive his children. And the only way that he can truly forgive is if he truly forgets. A king, on the other hand, pardons, which is only mentioned once in the verse. Since the sin remains, it's just overlooked, at least for now. The pardon can be rescinded. The numerical value of the word salak forgiveness is 98. This number has a great meaning since it connects to the 98 curses that are mentioned in the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, in the portion of Kisavo, chapter 28, verses 15 through 68. This is referred to as the tochacha, the admonitions. It describes all the punishments that will befall the Jewish nation if they fail to follow God's commandments. This prayer, Salach Lanu Avinu, forgive us our Father, is a protection from those 98 forms of retribution. You know, I heard someone say that forgiveness is a gift that you give to yourself. Many times when we find it difficult, if not impossible, to forgive someone, the person that really suffers is us. The internal struggles that go on in our bodies and in our minds. So much time is wasted with negativity that spills out into all arenas of our lives. Anxiety, high blood pressure, ulcers, sleepless nights, the list goes on and on. We review different scenarios in our mind. He said, she said, I said. It's enough to drive you crazy. Think of it. Why would you punish yourself for something that someone else did to you that hurt you in some way? It's nuts. It's masochistic. We can now see and understand the wisdom of the Torah. Don't hate. Don't take revenge. Don't bear a grudge. As the word ends with the words, 
which means you should love your friend. And if you can't bring yourself to love your friend, at least, kamocha, at least love yourself. All of these negative emotions are like holding on to a hot pot. The only one that is getting burned is you. Let it go. When it cools down, you can hold on to it indefinitely. It will never hurt you again. One of the most common reasons for not forgiving another person is that people are just too tough on others. However, they justify their position by saying that they are even tougher on themselves. The answer is simple. Be easier on yourself. Forgive yourself. And then maybe you'll be truly be able to forgive others. As it says in Pirkei Avot, Shimon said, do not consider yourself wicked. You know, there's a story of the Magadim is rich. He was in his study hall with his students and a rich man came in. The rich man bragged how he lived all week on only dried bread and salty fish. And this great rabbi rebuked him and said that he wanted him to eat meat and wine and all kinds of delicacies at all his meals. And when he left, the students were confused and they asked the Magid, why would you order the rich man to partake of delicacies at all of his meals? And he told them that if this rich man ate only bread and salty fish every day, can you imagine what he would give to a poor man that was hungry and came knocking at his door? But now, if he sits down to a meal that behooves a rich man, then maybe he may at least give the poor man some bread and salty fish. And so too with our relationship with others. If we can't forgive ourselves, how can we possibly forgive others? So always remember, forgive, and most of all, forget. Make sure to accept an apology and move on. Turn the page and don't look back. Then hopefully, by following this wisdom, Maybe usher in the period of the Mashiach Zikainu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God should bless you all. Be safe, be happy, and be healthy. God bless. Have a good week.